Welcome to the first video in phonology. So here's the question. What is phonology? What are we going to look at in this lecture series? Well, phonology is the study of sound patterns in a language or dialect. And essentially to do phonology, we're going to use some of the features of phonetic sounds, and we're going to see how those features interact with each other and lead to changes in speech. So there's one really important concept we have to get down right away, and that is the concept of a phoneme. And a phoneme is a basic sound in a language, but I really should say more than this. It is a basic contrastive sound in a language. So for instance, the K sound, K, in English is a phoneme. There are many different types of Ks, such as the palatal K in the word like cute, or we have an aspirated K in the word cup, or even an unaspirated K in the word bake but we hear them all as the same K. And that's what we mean by a phoneme, so that concept of a K in English. So English has between 37 and 41 phonemes, depending on the dialect that you encounter, uh, especially UK English versus American English. There's two very different Englishes, and they sound slightly different, and they have different numbers of phonemes. Now, this is about an average language in terms of sounds. Japanese, for instance, only has 22. It has five different vowels and has 17 consonants. Contrast this with English, which has between 13 and 16 vowels. And there's another language, which is also known as Ta, and I'll say Ta because I'll butcher this name if I attempt it, but it has 160 phonemes, which is just an absolute absurd amount of phonemes. If you want to meet a man or woman who knows how to use their mouth, uh, go find a Ta speaker because they can make pretty much every sound. Okay, so there are some things from phonetics that you should know, but I want to take a look at English consonants and vowels really quick, and if you're a little bit confused by the chart, my introduction to linguistic series, the phonetics section should teach you this, but it's a good idea to know these English consonants and vowels before proceeding any further with this lecture series. So first of all, here's all of the phonemes in English. There is one little change I want to make on this chart, which is the palatal voiced glide. Uh, typically, we use the letter J for this. Uh, but all these other sounds you should be familiar with. So for instance, we have P and B, T and D, K and G as our stops. We have our fricatives F and V. Uh, you may have forgotten, perhaps, this one, the dental voiceless fricative and the dental voiced fricative. So th as in thought and th as in thanks. Uh, we have S and Z. We have sh and j as in ship and azure. Then below it with the affricates we have ch as in cheese and j as in judge. And of course we have our nasals m and n. And finally our velar nasal in the word song at the end there, m. And then of course our liquids L and R or O and R, and then our glides W and Y. So those are the English consonants. Uh, if you can't remember these sounds again, please check the phonetic series out. Okay, we also have some English vowels. So you may remember this chart. You may have seen this chart uh, filled out with many more vowels. These are just the ones that we have in English. In fact, there is a little mistake here. Uh, this should be the epsilon there. And of course, in English, we know that we don't have just O on its own. That is a diphthong. And same with A is also a diphthong. From this chart, we are also missing I, OW, and I think OI. So we can fit them somewhere in this chart. Uh, really, we're not going to pay too much attention to the diphthongs, at least in the beginning. So really, we just want to pay attention to the simple and tense, or just say the simple vowels in English for now. Okay, and again, just to go over all of these sounds individually, uh, I will put this back here. So we have E, high front vowel, then E, 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 A, A, E, O, O, U, E, and then the schwa E in words like Canada, in the unstressed position. So again, if you need to review vowels, phonetic section, probably the place for you. Okay, so 
We know what a phoneme is. We know English has a bunch of phonemes. But the question is, how do we find them? How do we know what a phoneme is? Well, to find phonemes, the easiest way is to use something called minimal pairs. And that's when you find words that differ in only one sound, but they also differ in meaning. So here's a really basic one with English. It's kind of hard to demonstrate these with English because you're like, well, duh, I know it. But just to show it very systematically, let's say we have a word like pet and bet. They differ only in one sound. So the P and the B differ. The rest of the word is exactly the same. Now, even though they differ in one sound, the meanings are different. So the meaning of pet is not the same meaning as in bet. And this means that the words pet and bet are minimal pairs. And because they're minimal pairs, that means that these are different phonemes. In other words, think of this. When you hear the word pet and you hear the word bet, you don't hear them as the same word. You hear them as different words. And this means that these are minimal pairs. Okay. So... If two sounds, or we find minimal pairs with two sounds, then we say that P and B are phonemically distinct. So this means that the phoneme in slashy brackets here is linked to the phone, which of course is in our square brackets. So just to kind of talk about what these are, when we have a slashy bracket, this is of course phonemic. So this is a phonemic P. Well, in the square brackets, it is a phonetic P. So think of the phoneme as being that unit of the sound in your mind. So kind of an abstract sound. In other words, the phoneme may have a bunch of different phonetic representations for it that all come out acoustically different or physiologically different, but we hear it as the same thing. So the phonetic aspect is the physical properties of the sound and the phoneme would be the mental association we have for that sound. So just kind of as a little general guide here, so we have P going to P, but uh, you may have learned previously in phonetics, we also have an aspirated P, like in the word picket at the beginning, where we have this puff of air coming out of our mouth. Uh, in the word map, we may have a closed P at the end, so we may pronounce it just map. Uh, so these are all different types of P's, but we still hear it as a P in our head. We still think of it as a P. So this is the difference between phonemic representation and a phone. Okay, and similarly with B, there may be different types of B in English, but we can list them all under the same phoneme B. In other words, the real connection to make here is that when we hear a B, we don't link it back to P. We don't hear a phonetic B and think, oh, that's a P. At least not in English. So this is the difference between a phoneme and a phone or the phonemic representation and the phonetic representation. These are language specific. So another language might hear them exactly the same. But in English, this is how the chart would look. Okay, what about sounds that don't contrast? So here's a transcription. I have some pairs of words here like abe and ape, save and safe phase and face. Well, what's interesting here? Well, first of all, I have this little diacritic above the E, and this just means it's shortened. So in the left words, A, the diphthong, is not shortened, but in the right words, it is shortened. Now, there's no minimal pairs here, and why, why aren't there any minimal pairs? Well, because if you look at abe and ape, the b and the p are different, but also the diphthong is different because of the diacritic. So these are not minimal pairs. However, we notice that in some scenarios, we have the not shortened a, and in other scenarios, we have the shortened a. So the question is, can we talk about the environments that these sounds are in? in order to make some sort of generalization of how these sounds work. So, of course, you don't necessarily have the toolbox to do this yet, so I'll kind of just talk about this immediately now and give you an answer. But here, when A 
appears before voiceless consonants. So P doesn't have your vocal folds vibrating, F doesn't have your vocal folds vibrating, and S does not have those vibrations. Then A is shortened. So Abe and Ape, you can hear a difference in the length of that diphthong. Save and safe, phase and face, you can hear that difference. So we don't necessarily notice that these are different sounds, like they're shortened, but in our minds we don't think of them as different sounds. And this means that A and A are in complementary distribution, which means they're part of the same mental representation in our mind, but they have different acoustic properties. So one is shorter than the other, but we still consider them to be the same sound in our heads. So the phoneme is the one that occurs in most places. So we say A, the lengthened one, is the phoneme because it occurs in almost everywhere. Now the phoneme splits into allophones. So the short A occurs before voiceless consonants. So that is the environment for the allophone A. Now where does the standard A occur? Well, it occurs everywhere else. And I know in the data set I just showed the difference between voice consonants and voiceless consonants, but we can assume that if it comes before another voiceless glide or something that's even possible, then it would also be regular length. So in other words, we have this sound in our head and it's phonetically realized in two different ways. It's shorter before voiceless consonants and it's standard everywhere else. So this is what it means to be in complementary distribution. There is no overlap. So we're never going to find the lengthened A before voiceless consonants. That will never happen at least not in the dialect of English that I speak and maybe other people speak. So if, if you are in some area and you speak English and you're thinking, wait a second, I don't sound like that. Look, this isn't a rule that applies to every English speaker. This is a, just a pattern that is widely recognized in North America at the very least. Okay, so this is the difference between phoneme and allophone. So a phoneme can have multiple allophones. Allophones meaning different phonetic representations and phoneme being that mental representation. And all allophones have some environment that they are produced in. So for every allophone you have, you have some specific environment that you can talk about where that allophone occurs. So that's just kind of the basics. We're gonna get into a lot more detail in future videos, but there's some things you should definitely know before you continue on with this lecture series. First of all, you need to know your international phonetic alphabet. And second, you need to know descriptions of sounds. So look, a voiceless alveolar fricative, you should be able to say, okay, that's s. Or a high front unrounded tense vowel, you should be able to say, oh, that's e. And when you're given a sound, you should be able to describe it. These are very important notions for phonology because we use these features and descriptions of sounds in order to generate generalizations and rules about the processes that go on and how these sounds interact. We need to know that two sounds that are similar to each other may undergo assimilation or dissimilation, and that two sounds that have nothing to do with each other might not actually undergo any processes in any language because they're so dissimilar. So these are the types of things for phonology. As a general outline of where we're going with things, uh, first of all, we'll talk about features, and then we'll do rules under the guise of what we call SPE phonology. So this will be a context sensitive grammar rules. Uh, then we'll move on to different formalisms of phonology. So for instance, we'll talk about uh, feature geometry. And within feature geometry, we will talk about things like tone and stress and syllables and I believe a few more other things. And then we'll take all of this stuff and we'll transfer it into another framework called optimality theory. And these are two very different frameworks. So for instance, feature geometry is very rule-based while optimality theory is entirely constraint-based. So two different approaches, and these are both widely used in phonology. So it just depends on your own theory and personal opinions about how these things work. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them.